very, uh, very interesting uh, part of our work. That is the work that we do on solar. So, so far, uh, solar district heating, let's say, mainly in the past, had uh, a limited development uh, related mainly to Denmark. However, in the past years, we saw uh, that more, more an increasing interest in uh, in the south of Europe and in in, in actually in in few other areas. Uh, this webinar is part. Of, uh, of a EU-funded project that is called Solar District Heating Policy to Market. Uh, and, uh, and actually, uh, our first speaker will, will introduce uh, the, the project uh, more, more in depth. So here you see the, the agenda for today. You will see that indeed our first speaker is uh, Laura de Chantre from Solites. Then Wim Helden from Iontech will describe more uh, the issues that that are in the interactions between uh, solar, solar thermal, and thermal storage. Then Cedric Paulus from SEA Ines will talk about uh, some of the latest technology developments that he's working on. And finally, uh, Rainer Jensen from uh, WIP Renewable Energies will talk about uh, the work that the Renewable Eating and Cooling platform is doing uh, to pr promote renewable eating and cooling. And uh, so the, all of the interactions that we could have between solar and, and the other renewable eating and, uh, and cooling technologies. So I'll, I'll soon give the floor to, to Laure. Laure Deschamps is uh, uh, an energy and environmental engineer. She's part of SOLITES, which is a research institute for solar and sustainable thermal energy systems within the Steinbest network. And so Laure, please, the, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I hope so. <laughs> well, yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk to you about solar district heating and give you an overview of the activities in the Horizon 2020 project SDH-P2M. Um, About the technology itself and its potential, um, it's clear that we know we need renewable heat supply and we will still need it in the future. Um, and district heating is one of the key technologies to integrate renewable heat, waste heat, uh, efficient technologies at large scale in a quick and cost effective way because mostly because of the flexibility this solution represents. Um, solar district heating, uh, solar thermal energy itself, I think the advantages are, are also really clear. Um, it's emission free and really renewable. It brings back uh, the heat supply to the local level, meaning that the money and the work, the jobs stay, stay in the regions. Um, it's possible everywhere. Solar is available everywhere. Um, however, of course, there's a need for areas. I will come back to this barrier a bit later, but still at this point, I'd like to mention that actually solar is the most efficient renewable energy in terms of uh, the surfaces that it needs. Um, it's a major uh, technology, it's available on the market. Um, there are plants that have been running for more than 25 years. And today there are a manufacturer on the market that um, offer this technology from manufacturing just the collector, delivering just the collector itself, or 
turnkey plans or even contracting um, heat supply. Mm, yeah, there are plans for uh, the power goes up to 150 megawatt. This is the largest plant in Silkeborg, Denmark at the moment, but it's getting bigger and bigger. And um, one of the main advantages is also stable heat costs under 50 euros per megawatt hour. 50 euros per megawatt hour is a good price, but what's most important in the sentence is the word stable. Um, when you build this plant on the first day, you know uh, your cost for the next 25 years. And this is one of the reasons why district heating operators are really interested in this technology at the moment. And well, there are new opportunities opening on the heating market at the moment due to the high uh, renewable energy rate in the summer in the electricity market. Um, and yeah, CHP plants running less in the summer and well, the heat has to come from somewhere in here. Solar is one of the solutions. Um, as Alessandro said, at the moment, uh, the technology is booming in, in Denmark. Um, they reached 1 million square meters uh, installed last autumn. But we have also a lot of interest uh, in Germany at the moment, um, in bioenergy villages, for example, in rural areas. It's a good solution. But also um, in large cities, we have uh, decentralized plants that are being installed, like the largest German plant in Zentenberg with more than 8,000 square meters that was installed last year. Um, well, I think it's clear that this technology is um, ready. There is no, no question to the technical feasibility if I will not detail the technical stuff today, but if you have any question about this, um, don't hesitate to contact us or the project partners in your in your country. I will now move to our, um, our activity in market development of this technology. And just for the background, the SDHPGM project is uh, the third market development project. So it has started uh, this activity in 2009 with the SDH takeoff project. There the um, idea was to connect the solar thermal market and the district heating sector for the first time because they had never heard of each other before. And well, we had some very lonely moment at the beginning in the district heating fairs when we were like with our solar district heating booth um, a bit like newcomers but at the last uh, district heating fair in Germany um, all the collector manufacturers were there and we had a whole square to ourselves and they were really really happy because made a, a good uh, business. So there is a lot of, of progress since, since the beginning. And in the SDH Plus project, we um, uh, focused on business model and also extended the geographical area. More countries in Europe were part of this project. And in the SDH P2M project, we want to focus on, on policy. In order to do that, uh, we decided to focus on the regional level because um, on the regional level, it's easier to move things than on the national level where it takes always a bit more time, but it's still a, a level who, where you can still change things and move things where they have the the power to um, implement new policy or change the local policies. 
Um, in the project, we have uh, three regions as project partners, uh, Thuringen in Germany, Steiermark in Austria, and Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes in France. Um, this is really helpful because they can really achieve um, some impact in the project. And then we have six, um, five, six follower regions um, around Europe. Um, the idea is to develop policy and uh, support measures for solar district heating and uh, of course to learn the lessons from that and to share it with the rest of Europe um, so it can be applied in other European region or at national level. The aim is, of course, to establish solar thermal as a normal heat producer. That is uh, one of the choices that the district heating operator has um, when he decides to make a project or a new project or a refurbishment project um, to create a solar district heating favorable framework um, so that, that, for example, that it's taken into account in urban planning and heat planning, or that um, the access to areas is uh, made easier for renewable energy. Um, local authorities are often very interested in renewable heat, but don't really know how to promote them in their own territory. So here we help also. And um, of course, it's a continuation of this internal cooperation, which is really important um, at European level um, to understand why it's working in some frameworks in other less. And it helps, of course, uh, to make um, these frameworks better in the places where it's working less. Um, we are approximately at the middle of the project time. Um, what happened is that in each region, uh, an active stakeholder group was uh, created. And uh, together with the stakeholder groups, the barriers to market development have been identified. Um, and to answer this barrier, detailed action plans have been set up for each region with policy um, activities and uh, market support activities. And um, well, the different regions are working on sometimes similar topics, sometimes specific to their regions. One of the topics that is uh, coming a lot is the problematics of finding area. The Hamburg Metropole region is uh, focusing on that, but also in Austria, to, for example, is a, it's a topic um, how to adapt the regulation uh, for to help the stakeholders uh, find areas. Um, Austria, for example, is also, also developing a financing model for solar district heating. And um, it's also what is really an important topic is uh, capacity building of the market actors, so the local authorities, as well as the district heating uh, operators. This is, for example, a focus in France or in Bulgaria. Uh, and another point that is really important is the realization of feasibility studies that lead to pilot plans because there is no, no better um, trigger for someone to build a plan than to visit one and to see it with their own eyes and to meet the people who already implemented this solution and so that they understand that uh, it's working and they can do it. So um, if you're interested in this technology, uh, you're welcome to contact us or one of the 
product partners in your country, as I said. Um, on the website, as here on the slide, you will soon, very soon, find the first fact sheets that detail these um, policy actions and market development actions that are being implemented in each region. So if you want more information about this, and of course you're welcome to visit one of our events at national level or at international level, we will have the fifth International Solar District Heating Conference in Graz in Austria next year on 11 and 12th of April. Thank you for your attention. How do we Thank do you. clapping? Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, we, we can. Sorry, it's a webinar. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, so I wanted to, to add that, uh, of course, you can make questions. In order to do that, you have to see on your panel. Uh, on the panel on your uh, right, you should see a bar that says questions. So uh, you still have time to think about your, your question right now and, and, and type it, please. Uh, in the meantime, I'll present uh, the next uh, panelist. So the next panelist, uh, Wim Valdenden. Uh, Wim is a physicist with more than 15 years of experience in uh, solar thermal technologies and thermal energy storage. He works uh, uh, with iNTech in Austria and is leading a group of experts in compact thermal energy storage at the Institute. So uh, Wim will indeed talk about uh, uh, the, the, the role of, of storage, the role of thermal storage as an enabling technology uh, to, to, to wider the development uh, of, uh, of solar thermal. In the meantime, we see if we have questions for, for lore. Uh, we no, we do, we don't have we don't have question for lore. So anyway, uh, for now, no, for now. On you know you can type your questions uh, even uh, while the the presenter is giving the presentations and so we will know it uh, and we will ask the question after uh, after the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll give the floor uh, to Vim, please. Thank you, Alessandro. It's a, it's an honor and also a pleasure to uh, have this uh, to participate in this uh, webinar. You will be hearing in uh, the next 15 minutes on the status of uh, seasonal solar thermal energy storage, uh, about the, the work that's being done and the work that should be done to provide a better position and also a better uh, introduction into the market for compact uh, seasonal solar thermal energy storage. The, let me see it, yeah. Thermal energy storage is a key enabling technology. It provides, um, uh, say, the means to store energy for a, a range of applications. Among these also solar thermal uh, energy and uh, district heating. And um, there are three main principles. Uh, just uh, go quickly through the principles because the um, slides will be available afterwards also. There are three main principles, the sensible heat in which the heat is stored in the heat capacity of a substance. Um, uh, this is also the, the main application for uh, thermal storage, um, mostly in water, but also in, in solids or in other liquids. Then the more modern and also compact uh, thermal energy storage technologies are uh, in one kind, the latent heat in which the, um, uh, the energy is stored in a phase change, either melting or evaporation of a substance, and sorption heat and chemical heat, in which uh, there is a, a physical or chemical reaction, enthalpy available for storing uh, the heat in uh, one or more um, substances. 
The necessity for seasonal storage of solarite is well known. What you see here in this graph is that we have uh, uh, heat, heat demand, the total consumption of energy dependent on the season and peaking in the winter, while the availability of solar thermal energy is peaking in summer. So what we need is a, a, a technology in order to move the heat from the summer into the winter. If we would do this on a household scale with a sensible heat, for instance with a water storage, then we would need some something like 120 cubic meter of volume to store the heat. Uh, latent would uh, half this uh, required volume, while thermochemical energy storage technologies would lead to a reduction of 90% or so. So especially in those cases in the built environment where there's less volume available, we would uh, need uh, new compact thermal energy storage technologies in order to provide them with uh, sustainable solar heat from summer. There's one main um, thing that we need to address with uh, long-term uh, heat storage, which is the heat loss. Here are two graphs, two uh, curves that are giving the, uh, say, the, the efficiency, the cycle efficiency for a given technology. In blue, it's absorption technology, and in red, it's uh, uh, water, so a, a sensible storage technology. You see that uh, if you store water, then uh, the availability of heat is uh, slowly de decreasing over time, and after, say, 12 days, uh, as much energy uh, is available as is uh, initially also in the sorption storage technology, meaning that if you have longer periods over which the heat should be stored, uh, say longer than 12 days, then it's better to have sorption storage uh, over the sensible heat storage. There are several ways to overcome these heat losses in the technology, and one of the ways is to increase the volume. Uh, by increasing a volume of a sensible storage, um, the stored heat increases proportional to the volume, but the heat loss uh, increases in proportional to the surface area, meaning that if you have very large pit storages, for example, like in Denmark, then the heat losses relative to the heat stored is reduced very much. Therefore, for large-scale applications, the um, technology of storing heat in uh, larger pit storages or large sensible heat storage is uh, an available and very good technology. If you would like to have smaller volumes, then you either should apply super insulation, like vacuum insulation panels. Um, this would lead to a very large reduction of the losses, but these panels are relatively costly. So cost reduction through further development of these uh, technology would be required. The other way is turning into compact thermal energy storage technologies that have no or virtually no losses like uh, supercooled phase change materials or with uh, thermochemical materials. And you will see later a lot of examples for these, uh, for these technologies. One very important uh, element in comparing different uh, storage technologies is the storage density. Um, when looking at the material itself, then we can talk about the physical storage density. This is the storage density, uh, which is determined by the storage capacity of the material divided by the volume of the material itself. So, for instance, for water, it, this would be depending on the temperature difference, but in the order of 60 to 80 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. For comparison of systems in a certain application, however, we need uh, a storage density definition that also implies what the volume of the other elements are. And therefore, we uh, determine the volume of the black box of the storage uh, system and this volume uh, is always prismatic. So the, the footprint of this system is also always a square or a rectangular. 
And then we determine what the uh, amount of energy stored is divided by the storage volume of this box. box. In, in practice, you also need a service space around this black box in order to be able to maintain the system or to uh, repair it when it's defect. And when you include this service space, then you have the actual um, f uh, storage density of, the, of this uh, system. And this is the, the storage that is stored, the energy that is stored, stored in the compact storage divided by the total volume, including the service volume. So when comparing different technologies, you should always be aware that uh, the, the, say the volume taken in by the system is taken equal for both uh, technologies. This is a comparison of uh, a zeolite system, a sorption system that was developed in the Comtes project line A and a water storage of 800 liters. And you see, if we look at the material level, then the zeolite has 180 kilowatt hours per cubic meter and the water has 82 kilowatt hours per, per cubic meter. But this uh, storage density dilutes uh, depending on how much volume is taken by the auxiliary equipment and by the insulation. For the water storage, the, there is the effect of the insulation going from 82 to 36 kilowatt hours per cubic meter and then there's some additional equipment and the service paid inclu included leading to 30 kilowatt hours per cubic meter while the Zila system at the moment is diluted from 180 to say about 50 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So there's still some development needed in order to have this difference between 180 and 50 uh, reduced but uh, already now we see that for long-term seasonal storage the storage density for sorption is a factor two better than for water for reduced volumes. Vyland was one of the collaborators in the, uh, in the project and uh, we made also um, a, a division into the different types of storages that could be uh, made by uh, the different technologies and one uh, division is to into an external reactor design in which the reactor is separate from the storage of the actual actual material. So here the storage material will be transported from the storage to a reactor in which the heat is extracted or uh, charged. Or we have a second class of, of uh, systems in which the reactor is internal, uh, is combined with the storage volume and there the only um, heat or the only flow is heat from and to the, the volume of the uh, reactor and the volume of the storage. If we look into different uh, past and present projects, then we can make a division into uh, internal and external uh, reactor principle and whether it's an open cycle, so connected to the open air, or a closed cycle in which there is mostly also a lower pressure than ambient pressure. And you see that in, there are in these three um, positions there are a, a lot of um, projects being, uh, being done and in the combination external reactor and closed cycle up till now there was not a project and this is uh, caused by the fact that this technology is uh, much more difficult to, uh, to develop. So let's see uh, a number of uh, examples of these, uh, these projects and these type of, uh, of technologies. First example is from uh, Germany, from the ITW Institute at the University of Stuttgart, in which there is an open system uh, in which air is being circulated uh, through a reactor. And this reactor is a, a falling, um, falling grain reactor in which the zeolite grains will fall from top to bottom and the heat will be uh, extracted uh, by the air in two steps. This is the first preheating step and then there's the second heating step and then the heat from the air is extracted from the air by this external heat exchanger and then uh, the rest 
the remaining heat of the heat uh, in the in the air will be exchanged in this air to air heat exchanger this is a system that is now built up to a volume of uh, um, about 60 liters in the reactor and it's now being tested in a, in a real system another type of technology is the um, also an open sorption system it's a system that is being developed at the University of Lyon, the Institute CETIL, in a project that is called STAID. It's, uh, it's not for seasonal storage, but it's for heating peak power. And here you see two cylinders that contain the active material. And here the reactor uh, is a zeolite fixed bed, and the airflow is, is going through the fixed bed. And with this system, it's, it's, it's possible to have peak power, uh, auxiliary peak power, coming from this uh, Z-line beds. You see that, that here also, the, uh, there's a lot of uh, channels for the airflow in order to get the proper power out of the, the, the Z-line bed. The next system example is from Belgium. It's uh, from the University of Mons with uh, uh, a number of other institutes and uh, uh, companies. And this is in the Soterco project. It's a EU project uh, also aiming on seasonal storage of solar thermal energy. And here it's an open, uh, again, an open system in which the reactor type is different. Here the uh, zeolite beads are being transported through a reactor drum and then the heat is being transferred um, to a heat exchanger in the drum itself. The project uh, has uh, three steps. The first step is uh, developing a number of composite materials which are a combination of uh, uh, an open porous medium and an impregnated salt hydrate. And there were four, four types of, of materials developed and then tested on a lab scale reactor in, uh, on the intermediate uh, volume. And then uh, on a real scale reactor, uh, a bigger volume of material was tested in order to see the dynamics of this uh, system. We now switch to uh, uh, a phase change material uh, technology. One of the development lines in the Comtes project is uh, based on the supercooling of uh, sodium acetate. It's a material that melts at 58 degrees centigrade. If you heat it, then the internal heated uh, capacity or the stored capacity is, uh, is moving upwards very quickly at this melting uh, point and then uh, it increases gradually with the, the heat capacity. If uh, we go to, um, if we cool down the material, then it will cool down and stay liquid until room temperature at 20 degrees. And then in the next step, uh, if we activate, so solidificate the material, then the crystallization um, energy is, uh, is becoming available, but the material increases its temperature again until 58 degrees centigrade. And then this amount of heat from here to there is available for, uh, for heating. This means that uh, you can compose a system of different modules, each module containing this uh, uh, sodium acetate. In summer, the module is being charged by solar heat and in winter, it can be discharged by igniting the solidification in the module. Then the complete module will solidify and the heat will become available for heating. And because the complete volume uh, in one instance will solidify, you need a system that consists of a number of modules. And within the Compass project, uh, four modules were developed and tested in a system which was driven by solar thermal collectors and which provided also energy to, uh, to a dummy uh, system in, in winter. We uh, stay with the line B of the Comtes and there we have another 
principle, uh, which is based on a liquid sorption. Here is the, uh, the schematics and it's, um, the principle is actually the same as with uh, solid sorption. Um, for instance, in, in red, the charging uh, is being depicted. Solar heat is used here to, uh, to desorb um, um, uh, a solution of sodium hydroxide and water, meaning that uh, the solution becomes more concentrated. Water vapor is driven out of this uh, solution and is condensed in the condenser and then stored as uh, liquid water. And uh, the condensation heat is then going to a heat sink. In winter, the uh, cycle is reversed and then a heat source is used to evaporate the water. The water vapor is then taken up by the concentrated sodium lye. Heat is being generated by the sodium lye and this heat is being used for domestic hot water and space heating. The um, contest line B uh, was centered around um, developing this uh, reactor and um, uh, combination of reactor and uh, evaporator condenser. And this was tested in a, in a real system. And in the system was uh, installed in a container and the container was equipped with uh, 20 square meters of uh, vacuum tube collectors. And then um, from the uh, experiments, it showed that the, the design uh, of the um, of the absorber, desorber, was uh, was not proper because the actual um, say um, heat transfer and mass transfer of the system was too low to to provide enough heat uh, and power to the uh, to the system, and the project is now being continued in an optimization of this reactor configuration. If we go to line A, this was a system that was also developed in uh, in the Comtes project. AE Intact was was leading this uh, this uh, development line. Here, a solid sorption material is the active material in a closed cycle, meaning that there is a fixed bed of zeolite that is being charged and discharged by solar heat. The same principle as as with the uh, liquid uh, sorption process that was shown previously. And the system consists of two large one cubic meter storage vessels, a solar thermal collector on the roof, and then a heat source and heat sink for the evaporator condenser and um, an emulation program that emulates the space heating and domestic hot water demand of a single family house. This is uh, an example uh, or, or some pictures of the uh, heat exchanger that is in the large one cubic meter storage uh, of zeolite. Here the heat exchanger is being lowered into the vacuum vessel. And this is, uh, these are the zeolite beads uh, visible in the vacuum vessel, vessel in between the plates of the heat exchanger. We did some experiments with that and uh, the experiment showed that depending on the heat uh, being provided by the solar thermal panels, if we provide 180 degrees degree centigrade, it were vacuum, evacuate, vacuum evacuated tube collectors, then we arrive at 137 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. However, we, we also experimented with a new technology in which uh, uh, pressure difference between two vessels is used to further uh, desorb the zeolite and here we found 170 degrees centigrade or 170 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. From the past and present projects we see now that for seasonal uh, solar thermal storage for the compact uh, storage uh, we, show, we showed that several proof of concepts were uh, were valid, they were delivered. So the, we have several technologies that can provide and can work according to the, to the specifications. However, the performance over cost ratio is still low. So the performance needs to be improved and the costs need to go down, especially the cost of the, of the active materials. 
And we see, also see that we need better knowledge of the design and optimization of the components. And the key components are especially the reactors and the uh, evaporator condenser. International research is also ongoing. Uh, we had a past uh, IEA task 42 uh, Annex 29 uh, activity. This is now since January being followed up by task 58 Annex 33. Uh, it's a three-year task in which uh, the materials and application experts are collaborating in order to uh, improve the materials for thermal energy storage and also to have better uh, knowledge on the design and optimization of components. Twice per year we meet in expert meetings and we, the work is not only on different projects but also on common goals to have deliverables in different fields. And I skipped these uh, objectives and scope to go to the subtask structure. What we do in the, in the task annex is we have two lines, one line on phase change materials and a second line on thermochemical materials. And for every line there are different subtasks, a first subtask on the um, definition of boundary conditions for relevant applications for this thermal energy storage, then a subtask on the improvement and characterization of uh, materials, a subtask on the procedures for measuring the materials and for testing them under the application conditions, and the subtask for the component design for innovative uh, thermal energy storage materials. Each subtask is uh, led by uh, one or two um, subtask leaders and uh, also every subtask has common goals. For instance, uh, for subtask three, it's the goal to have uh, a common and also replicable procedure for measuring the enthalpy of uh, storage for different materials, zeolites, but also for salt hydrates. If we go now to tomorrow, to the farther future, what, what are the things that, uh, that we target for uh, compact thermal energy storage, for seasonal solar thermal energy storage? Um, for 2025, we envision a further increase of the system storage density, so going to values uh, say above 200 kilowatt hours per cubic meter on system level to demonstrate the number of systems but also to have first field experiments so to in, co uh, in collaboration with industry have systems in place that are being experimented on in field tests. What is needed for that is that we have an, a programmed and international approach. Uh, one of the Possibilities is to have a virtual knowledge institute, a collaboration of different institutes over Europe in order to uh, combine the uh, activities on compact thermal energy storage development. And uh, what is also needed is a, um, a targeted parallel approach, not only on materials research, but also on component dev development, system development, system demonstration and industry development. The work is being done, uh, one of the channels also is through the renewable heating and cooling technology and innovation platform. And uh, we work on uh, shaping the strategic energy technology plan on a European level, on an international level also the mission innovation uh, activity, uh, the ongoing Horizon 2020 program and the next and ninth framework program which does not have a dedicated name at the moment. And of course also national programs uh, for European countries are being worked on. This is in a nutshell the uh, status and uh, the plans for um, compact thermal energy storage for seasonal storage of solar heat. And um, I'm, I'm glad to uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Finn. Thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive presentation uh, on the thermal storage technologies. Uh, while we wait to see if there are questions for you, 
uh, we I'm gonna pass in the meantime to present the the next speaker who is uh, Cedric Paulus, uh, who is the deputy head of the High Temperature Solar System Laboratory and coordinator of district heating activities in the French Research Center Sia uh, Ines. Um, so. Cedric is going to talk about uh, uh, the work uh, that uh, that they are currently doing on uh, facing uh, uh, solar district heating with the fourth generation of district heating. I'm sure he's going to tell you more on what we mean for fourth generation. In the meantime, if there are no questions for Vim, yes, I'll give the floor uh, to Cedric. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you to present um, what we have done about our new experimental platform to, to work on solar district heating and also fourth generation district heating challenges. So maybe just a small brief introduction. Does it work? Yes. Oops. Yes, yes, yes. No. I don't think it moves from one slide to another. Okay. You normally should have the control. Can you try again? Yes. I tried, but it didn't work. Oh, yes, now. Now, now, yes. Yes, okay. Now it works. So here it's a slide where there's a, um, whole presentation about the evolution of district heating. It is done by the fourth generation district heating research center, which from this um, picture you can see the, the evolution from one century from to now. Um, so at the beginning, uh, 100 years ago, some, the district heating were uh, from high temperature uh, working level. So we're mainly using fossil fuels and only one type of fuel, which was coal. And since uh, there was a lot of evolution, with including more and more different kind of, uh, of fuel, different kind of uh, energy, and to decrease also the level of temperature of the different district heating. And this will um, uh, lead to the next generation of uh, district heating, which are called fourth generation district heating, which will be district heating that will work at low temperature. They will also integrate many kinds of different energy, for geothermal, solar energy, CHP, large storage, and so on. And there will be also connection with other kind of grid, like the electrical grid with some uh, connection between the CHP um, with a thermal and electrical grid and also uh, with some large um, heat pumps. So what are the challenges that were identified uh, from this um, uh, um, from this uh, institute who work on fourth generation district heating? So does it work? No. no. Uh, not not yet. Maybe there is a small delay, or can you try again? Otherwise, we can change it for you when you say next. If it, if you, the, we keep having the problem. Yes, next. If you want. Like next, like. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, you can move it next if you want. So, next. the challenges of small generation district heating that were identified are. The ability to supply uh, low temperature district heating for space heating and domestic hot water to, to existing building, uh, and also energy renovated existing building and new low energy buildings. It means that there will need some low temperature space heating, some intelligent control of heating and buildings and peak shaving. The challenges of fourth generation DH are also the ability to distribute heat in networks with low grid losses. It means that network will work at lower temperature, so that there will be some development of district heating pipes with improved uh, insulation. Uh, there will be also some intelligent control and metering of network performance. Challenges are also the ability to recycle it from low temperature sources and integrate renewable heat 
sources such as uh, solar energy, geothermal heat, heat from CHP and waste incineration, waste heat from processes also, uh, and solar thermal that could be central or decentralized plant, including also some large storage. Challenges are also um, the ability to be integrated part of a smart energy system. It means that it should be connected to also the other um, energy vectors, like gas uh, also, and, uh, and electricity. With, for example, the connection with the, the CHP and integration of large-scale heat pump um, to connect uh, electricity grid and uh, thermal grid. And it will also be the challenges to the ability to ensure suitable planning cost and motivation structure through um, in relation to the operation as well as to the strategic investment related to transformation into future sustainable energy systems. So this is all the different challenges that were identified from the, the fourth generation technology platform. And so we have worked on the development of a technology experimental platform to face most of the techno technical challenge uh, for the development of new products that could be experimented for this fourth G generation district heating. So we have developed an experimental platform allowing to implement, test, and validate innovative components uh, or system in real environment. It could also possible to be implement our advertisement management algorithm or also to validate the different dynamic modeling and simulation that we are doing. It is a scalable platform that connects also the three different energy vectors, the heat, gas, and electricity. And it is also our experimental platform connected to the other uh, platforms that we have in our institute. So we can use all of them together. So maybe next slide. So you can maybe move a lot because there are lots of animation. So this micro district heating and cooling uh, is uh, made of one central plant with a different kind of energy. It's a, there is a gas condensing boiler. There are some solar collectors also, 300 square meters. There would be a power to heat equipment. Uh, it's, a, it's a heat pump of 50 kilowatts. Uh, there are also CA combined heat and power an absorption chiller that will use the heat produced by the district heating to feed the district cooling ne network. We have also a thermal storage, um, um, a heat uh, storage of 40 cubic meters, and also a cold uh, storage of five uh, cubic meters. There is four pipes for the distribution. There is a two pipes for the heat. We can adjust the temperature as we want between uh, 95 uh, to 50 uh, degrees. Um, there is also two pipes for the cold district heating. And after we have different kinds of consumer, we have the different industrial and office building on our site that are connected to this micro district heating. And we also have um, uh, some thermal needs that are emulated connected to another uh, test bench that we have at INES, so we can emulate every kind of, uh, of uh, need uh, that we want. And we have also um, the control and the monitoring of this micro district heating and cooling that is done, and we, have, we can put some advanced control algorithm. So maybe now some more about some picture on how it is connected to other platforms. So this is our smart thermal network. So we have this is a picture of the gas condensing boiler. We have also some solar collectors panels on the roof with, with different kind of technology of solar collectors, uh, maybe six different kinds of technology of solar collectors with large flat plate solar collectors with different kind of, uh, of uh, technology inside, uh, also different kind of um, um, uh, uh, vacuum tube solar collectors. Then we have also some heat and cold thermal storage. Uh, as we, it's um, um, based on sensible heat storage. It's not a phase change material or thermochemical. Um, we have also 
the different buildings that are connected to this district uh, smart thermal network. We have, after that, um, the, an absorption chiller. It is not this installed yet. It will be installed within this year or at the beginning of next year. We have also um, a smart substation that will be installed uh, on the emulated uh, test uh, room. Uh, we have also the um, uh, this is the electrical microgrid that we have uh, at Ines, and it will be connected to our smart thermal network uh, through um, a heat pump that will be installed also uh, uh, at the end of the year. And there is also a connection with our gas network through the gas condensing boiler, but also through a CHP that will be installed and that will connect, that will produce some heat for, and also some electricity. So as we see, we have an, all the different uh, components that are described in the fourth generation district heating, and we can adjust and change every kind of component, add a new run, and to, to, to work on a piece of, um, of uh, this kind of district heating. So you can move to the next slide. Now we can work on the different kind of development on collectors, on advanced control, on a specific substation and so on. So I choose um, a next, uh, an example uh, of the development of a two-way substation to explain you how we can connect our, um, can use our technology platform. So just some a brief introduction about some SIM system testing, uh, because it's quite important. Uh, sometimes we are working a lot on efficiency of components, but what is important to understand is that um, a, there is a thermal system that is an assembly of many components and that compose the system that include also the control. And it is important to determine the global, the global performance of the systems. And um, it's not um, a sum of the efficient components that make uh, an efficient system. So you need to work also at the system level uh, because the system is also working in dynamic and that's why it's important to test a global system. So we are working for that on some semi-virtual tests. What is that? It is some tests that are in real time and we can uh, we make some uh, some sequences of test sequences that will produce in a limited time the operation of the system over different periods of the year. So it means that we can test now some winter season and we are not uh, needed to wait until winter to test it. So we can test it now in, in June. And what is also interesting to this approach is you have also some reproducible sequences. And so when you, you detect a, a, full, um, a dysfunctionment of the installation, you have the possibility to reload the, this same test sequence and to see if the modification you made on the system has improved this. So you can move to the next slide. So this is a, the example based on a, on a two-way substation. What is a two-way substation? A substation on a district heating, it takes heat from the district heating network to provide it to the space heating and to, to produce also domestic hot water. And now and it's more and more um, uh, important. Now we can work also on that the consumer or not only consume energy, but he will be maybe in the future also producer of energy. So we can work on some substation that will also produce energy at the level of the building. So this substation also can also feed some solar energy into the district heating if there is some heat surplus of uh, production, for example. So you can click maybe two or three times. So a normal substation, you should connect it on the um, district heating pipes on the left, you the space heating you connect it to the house, the, the domestic water to 
the tapping water and the solar collectors. So on our test bench, what we do, we replace, you can click also now, replace the front of the thing. You can click on the Okay, okay. we yes. have a little bit. We, so we replace, for example, see how? Cedric, okay. we have a, a bit um, of a so issue you... with uh, uh, Cedric. We have a bit of an issue with your sound. Uh, maybe if you can test it. Uh, it works now. Yes. Oh, yes. Hopefully, yes. Hopefully, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, uh, I have a bad connection here. So, um, um, so what I was saying is that we replace all the different external components. For example, the space heating uh, floor from the house by a module. We replace also the, the tapping, the tap uh, water by uh, a module. The same from the solar collectors also. And you can click maybe two or three times also. And so we connect all the pipe to our micro district heating network that I explained, uh, that I detailed before, and the same for the solar collectors. So we, you can go on the next slide. So what you see is that we have some real parts, some real component, and some virtual component. So on the left side, we have the real parts. For example, this is a two-way substation. And we connect it to through module to a virtual part where we have some model of components, model of solar collectors, or model of building, model of domestic hot water needs that we will produce the needs. Uh, and so the system we develop, it will work in dynamic condition, and we will test whatever we want on the different condition uh, that we, we can emulate. So this is a principle, for example, using the tech, our experimental platform for testing a specific uh, substation for district heating that can feed also some solar energy. So you can move to the next slide. It is my last slide about conclusion and perspective. So this is quite a new experimental platform. It is in operation now since uh, two or three months. It was a work for a two years work to develop this uh, platform and to realize it. So it is now ready for fourth generation district heating. It is a real approach uh, based in a controlled laboratory environment. It is also a scalable platform where we can integrate new component technology. It is not fixed. We can maybe integrate new kind of technology uh, that will be developed in the coming years. And it is also complementary to only simulation based theoretical approach. Now we can click also. And what are the perspectives uh, for us for using the platform? We are working on solar thermal integration with the development of new innovative solar thermal collectors field. For example, so we can test different kind of connection onto the district heating uh, with centralized or decentralized feeding, some return to return, return to flow connection with or without uh, uh, storage. We are also working on advanced control of district heating. We are working on fault detection also through this um, experimental platform. We are working on development of innovative substation, um, also of the different possibilities to integrate storage in district heating and also with the connection between the different smart energy network with some electrical or, or gas grid through power to heat or, or combined heat and power. So that's all for my presentation. I hope you hear me quite well and sorry for, for that. So we are working a lot in different kind of uh, project uh, where we use this platform and we are focusing on each kind of different component uh, within this different project. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric. Uh, I, I think the connection was uh, was was fine. Uh, we just had a small interruption. Uh, so in why we wait to see if there are questions for you, actually, uh, there are two questions for uh, for the previous presentation uh, for Vim, so on the storage. Uh, so Vim, uh, if you if you are ready, I can read the questions to you. Vim. Uh, 
Yes. So, uh, so the first question is: uh, uh, Do you state, Vim? Do you state that there are several proof or concepts for storage that are valid, uh, among others, open and closed systems with integrated or external reactors? In your view, which one ones do you consider to be the most viable for future domestic applications, and and why? Um, the short answer is that um, there will be a host of technologies that will be suited for the built environment because there is no singular built environment, there's no singular house. There will be houses that are part of uh, a multifamily building, there will be houses that are standalone uh, with and without a, a grid, there will be houses uh, in northern countries or in uh, middle European regions or in southern regions. So there will be no uh, singular technology that is uh, that it has to be considered as say the the most viable solution. Mm -hmm. So at the, at the moment there there is a competition between the different technologies and there's no clear view that that there will be one technology that if, uh, fits all applications. Okay, and just I mean, this is like my own question in terms of cost. How do you, how do you see it? Like there are what which are the the ones that are closer to the market? Uh, it, it yeah, the the cost is uh, at at the moment zeolites um, are within the technologies that are proven, the which the concepts are proven at the moment. Um, while at the same moment zeolite has still a, a too high cost. Uh, okay. Well. Whether this is uh, through the uh, uh, scale of economy, because there is too little zeolite produced and the price can go down if there's more produced, uh, or that there's a fundamental problem there, I'd, I'm not aware of that. We, uh, we are working now on salt hydrates as a second generation of uh, compact thermal energy storage materials, and these, um, in principle, have lower costs. Okay, thank you. And there is actually another question I think uh, uh, is also for you. Uh, is the solar thermal storage compatible with the geothermal storage? Um, I would say that that will depend on the system composition. Um, geothermal storage, uh, if it's storage that is on lower temperature, could uh, be combined with uh, solar thermal storage that is compact. Uh, for instance, by providing lower temperature heat uh, in, in winter in order to uh, make, with the closed systems, make possible that uh, the heat is generated on higher temperatures from the compact thermal energy storage. So depending on the, on the combination of the different technologies, it's compatible, yes. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Wim. So I'll pass to uh, our last speaker, uh, who is uh, uh, Dr. Ryan Jensen, uh, Managing Director for Projects at WIP Renewable Energies and Senior Expert in, uh, in, in Biomass. Uh, he graduated in physics and actually uh, an important player also in the renewable heating and cooling uh, uh, platform. Uh, but I let the, the floor to, to Rainer to, to, to tell us more about what the, what the work has been done uh, uh, by the renewable heating and cooling. I was my previous job, I was a coordinator uh, for uh, at UREC for, for this platform. I'm now currently in the board and I know that a lot of work has been done. I'm uh, quite proud of, of the, all the people involved, but I, I let Rainer uh, tell us more about it. Yeah, so uh, th thanks a lot, uh, Alessandro, uh, for the kind introduction. Also, thanks for all your previous work on the uh, on the platform. Uh, still uh, highly appreciated. And uh, also, uh, warm welcome to all uh, participants of the the webinar. Uh, now, having the last uh, presentation is is not an easy task, uh, so I'll try to be fast. I think we're also running uh, short of time. And the main aim for me is just to. Uh, introduce to you, um, as Alessandro put it, the um, uh, aims and activities of uh, the renewable heating and cooling technology and innovation platform. Uh, the importance actually of international cooperation on research uh, and innovation was already kindly uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Wim in his uh, talk. 
um, it is, um, um, uh, I'm also trying to move to the next slide. Ah, okay, it's gonna come. Um, so I think it is out of question that these kind of platforms and networks to bring together stakeholders from different European countries, in the case of IEA mentioned by Wim, even sort of beyond the EU, um, is uh, an, an excellent means basically to join forces and move uh, for, uh, forward sectors. So actually the European uh, technology platforms, as they were called initially, were initiated by the European Commission as one of the pillars within the set plan, the strategic energy technology plan by the Commission. So they, they are kind of a, a, an official body of the European Commission to, to drive uh, uh, technology innovation. Uh, and actually there is more than 20 different technology platforms and are, I think around uh, 10 active in the, the broad field of, uh, of renewable energy. Um, so, as mentioned, the idea of these platforms is to accelerate technological development in, in uh, promising or, let's say, uh, so, uh, sectors that are considered uh, of societal importance. Um, the governing rules are that uh, in this platform, they, they, they should be a platform for, for uh, everybody, let's say, including research industry, public sector um, uh, individuals even. Um, the initial idea of the Commission was to have the uh, platforms being industry-led. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, most platforms have a uh, little problem with that because uh, like industry means uh, people have a uh, few time for this uh, kind of inter international networking activities. Uh, but still, it is important that uh, it combines research, industry and all other um, uh, sectors. Uh, of equal importance is that these platforms, they have a, a transparent and open structure. So uh, let's say there is kind of no uh, pre-selection to uh, people. Let's say anyone can participate via the website that I'm going to present on my last slide. And uh, then, of course, if you want to uh, 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 move towards uh, a steering wheel within the platforms, there is elections towards governing bodies, but in general, uh, these platforms are open to all and uh, everybody is invited to voice uh, positions that then might or might not find its way into, uh, into uh, official documents from the platform. So with respect to the activities of the platform, the, the first part, and I will, I will present that in more detail later, was to create a vision for the sector of renewable heating and cooling, uh, followed them uh, then uh, by a strategy and, uh, uh, and uh, a roadmap on how basically to move towards this uh, uh, vision. Um, some of the expected results of these platforms is, act is actually, as mentioned before, to harmonize research activities, bring together different players to pull in the same direction and then move uh, forward technology development. And by, by that way, of course, a more, more efficient use of uh, um, research and development funding. Um, Last year, actually, the uh, Commission has changed the um, technology platforms uh, into technology and innovation platforms. Um, actually, for the heating and cooling sector, there was not a lot of change because we didn't have a so-called European industrial in, uh, industrial initiative in that sector. But the, these new platforms are supposed to combine two bodies from um, the uh, the set plan uh, and also my personal feeling is that the word innovation uh, needed to show up somewhere prominently so this is why they they put it basically in the title of all these uh, platforms uh, now there is uh, in, in general for the heating and cooling platform uh, uh, matters of operation have not changed a lot uh, however we are invited to interact more with the member states uh, and also uh, uh, play some specific act, uh, efforts to involve uh, uh, public sector and uh, NGOs, so all that is ongoing. Uh, I'm just dropping another name here, which is the so-called temporary working groups, uh, where the platform is getting involved in several of those, and uh, these are actually member state like <laughs> initiatives initiated by the Commission and uh, led by member states and uh, uh, stakeholders uh, to now move forward uh, towards the implementation um, of uh, actions within uh, different technology-related uh, sectors. 
my personal feeling is that uh, all that is uh, in the framework of the European Commission in general giving more power to member states, uh, which uh, you can also see in the implementation of the 2030 energy and climate package. Eh? So some of the responsibility is shifted from European level to member state level. Um, uh, again, my personal feeling, uh, uh, Brussels doesn't want to be blamed for everything that is going wrong. Eh? So now the, the, the member states uh, are more responsible. So on this, our specific uh, heating and cooling platform, it was actually, there was a solar thermal platform founded in 2005. And then by 2008, that was enlarged to include uh, other heating and cooling sectors. And uh, again, to my knowledge, it is one of the few platforms that actually have different uh, technology sectors uh, uh, working together and combined, um, uh, which I, I generally think uh, is, a, is a very good idea to move towards our, uh, let's say, future highly interactive um, sustainable energy system. As mentioned, it's an official uh, body uh, endorsed by the European Commission. Here you find the, the number more than 800 members are currently um, registered in the platform. Not all of them are, are active, I have to admit. Um, with respect to the governing structure, so we have a, a board where Alessandro already mentioned he is part of it. Also Wim and myself are part of the, the kind of this uh, steering body of the platform and the president of the platform is Gerhard Strieb uh, from Fraunhofer Ise. And then we luckily we have the support uh, of a secretariat um, a guy, uh, led by Jurek uh, in the name of uh, Paola Mazzucelli uh, and also involving uh, a variety of other industry associations. Then we are currently operating with uh, five panels, uh, uh, solar, thermal technology panel, biomass panel, geothermal panel and the heat pumps panel and in addition to that there is a, a cross-cutting technology panel. Um, I promised you that I will uh, show you a few of the uh, recent output, uh, output documents of the, the platform. Uh, and actually, I would, uh, if you're interested in the sector, uh, uh, even though there is, there are a few years old, most of the, the statements are still highly relevant. And they're also, let's say, nicely layout and prepared, still a good reference document. So we started with a, a vision where we would, uh, we think we could be in 2050. Uh, then there was a, um, a let's say, stakeholder uh, activity uh, over several years, collecting uh, what we call strategic research priorities. So actually, which kind of uh, technological problems and research questions need to be solved to move towards this vision? Uh, these are documents for all the sectors. Uh, um, and, and these topics are summarized in the so-called strategic research and innovation agendas. Uh, the next step was then the so-called technology roadmaps, which actually take over uh, the, uh, the strategic research priorities from the other document and put there a timeline and money and the uh, implementation and uh, things that need to be done in order to address these research uh, priorities. And they, I mentioned all these documents can be downloaded from the from the website. Um, now, actually, um, as you can see, that all this uh, work, um, uh, like all that, uh, is quite some effort. Uh, so the European Commission kindly supported the um, the platform uh, by for the coordination of all the stakeholders towards the preparation of these documents. Um, uh, by support to the Secretariat and actually in, in the years 2015 to 17, uh, there, uh, the European Commission support is in the form of a tender, uh, which is kind of a little problematic, but I'm not going to go into detail here. Uh, but what uh, basically is done now within this tender is that actually uh, based on the documents that I was just uh, presenting, uh, the, the platform is tasked to see basically how is the implementation towards these roadmaps uh, uh, proceeding. So that is task that is currently ongoing. So what has already been achieved, uh, what, what, is still, what is still needed. Uh, then just uh, a slide on, uh, on the, the, the vision and I will just roughly go through. So you, you see here <clears throat> that towards 2050, there is a general assumption that the heating and cooling demand will, go, will be reduced. Uh, that is due to um, energy efficiency um, measures, uh, broadly speaking. And uh, you can see here that we were rather optimistic. So, so we think that in general, renewable uh, renewables can cover 
100% of that heating and cooling demand. And of course, uh, visions need to be visionary. Uh, so 100% is a, is a nice vision. If you look here in uh, 2014, uh, the achievement is 17.7%. Uh, so um, uh, quite a way uh, towards uh, the vision, but, but the, the platform basically is one of the uh, uh, how to say one of the groups uh, of stakeholders that is actively uh, promoting the push of more renewables in the heating and cooling uh, sector. But there, as you see, there is still a lot, uh, a lot to do. I have a few slides now on uh, uh, the the different technology panels, like one each um, um, for of the the platform. So on the uh, solar thermal market. Um, just a few figures here. I'm not going into detail, only that you will probably know that the, the unfortunately solar thermal currently has a negative growth rate, uh, which of course is a pity. It's due to um, also low, the, the current low fossil fuel prices. And uh, what we heard earlier from the from the speakers, of course, solar district heating. Uh, it, I, I, I hope that that would be a, a potential solution to reverse this current uh, market trend in the uh, solar thermal uh, area. Uh, some of the challenges were already mentioned. Of course, cost reduction is always needed, is always uh, fine or, or true for all technologies. Uh, simplification and compactness was also, uh, let's say, mentioned in previous uh, presentations. And uh, also, of course, what is interesting, in addition to household level applications, uh, solutions for industrial uh, processes. Here on the on the right hand side, uh, there is just sort of a selection of uh, main research topics that have been identified by the, the platform stakeholders and are sort of further described and addressed in the, the documents mentioned. Uh, so you have here the solar compact hybrid systems and uh, if you just have a quick look on this uh, rather small graph then you of course see the solar thermal panel and then there's a boiler here and uh, me of course I'm, I'm assuming that's a biomass uh, uh, based boiler so bringing together uh, uh, different technologies and then you have the concept of solar active houses um, so th th that uh, is addressed in the, the framework of this nearly zero energy Buildings, um, obviously, let's say, uh, if uh, we we start uh, on having, uh, let's say, positive energy, uh, energy producing uh, buildings, uh, at least some of the uh, or most of the newly built ones, uh, then this will help us a lot in within the uh, or towards a, a more sustainable future energy system here. Uh, and down here below, solar heat for industrial processes. I I did mention before that is of of. Uh, high importance as well. For the uh, uh, biomass uh, technology panel, actually biomass um, uh, heating is currently the, the major source in uh, in Europe. Here you have the, some figures and the, let's say 13% uh, uh, of the total is used in, in district heating. And uh, as uh, also shown uh, before, let's say the combination of very different sources, including biomass and solar thermal and uh, heat storage, uh, is is the way towards uh, towards the future. Um, here, actually, you have uh, you have some challenges that are faced by biomass-based systems. I'm not going uh, through them in detail, but again, of course, uh, cost reductions are uh, are a topic here. And uh, with respect to main research topics um, tackled by the uh, the biomass panel of the uh, the platform. Uh, we, we are focusing on advanced fuels to replace coal and uh, fossil fuel and natural gas. Uh, and these advanced fuels are basically upgraded, upgraded biomass feedstock like pyrolysis oil, for instance, or, or uh, torrefied uh, pellets. And then there's activities on micro and small scale CHP units, uh, as well as on uh, large scale industrial uh, steam um, CHP units uh, and uh, actually of course we also focus on the uh, the way uh, the, on system integration meaning mainly how can we benefit from the uh, the storability and non intermittency of uh, biomass in uh, to complement the intermittent uh, sources solar and wind in the overall energy uh, system okay On uh, geothermal, 
um, I have to admit that this is not my, my main <laughs> main field, geothermal, so I will uh, just go uh, and read to you the, the main uh, research topics here. Um, so more research work uh, needs to be focused on enhanced geothermal uh, systems, e.g. the EGS technology, and uh, make them more cost competitive. Um, the same is true for geothermal combined heat and power plants by optimizing efficiency in installation and operation. And then, of course, for for uh, all sort of the, the deep uh, drilling geothermal uh, large units, um, one of the major topics is basically um, how to make sure that the, the drillings are successful and uh, how to reduce the, the, the costs uh, and, uh, let's say, the... Um, uh, the success rate of these uh, drillings, because uh, let's say, of course, you have a large upscale investment to be done. Uh, then, if that is not fully successful, um, uh, that you will have difficult difficulties finding uh, financing sources for that. So, uh, to my knowledge, that is one of the uh, very hot topics within uh, so the uh, the geothermal uh, technology panel. On the, I, I don't have a slide on the heat pumps uh, panel, but on the cross-cutting um, technologies panel, and here, uh, basically, district heating and cooling uh, is tackled within the uh, the platform, uh, as well as uh, thermal energy storage. Uh, both of them were were uh, discussed um, uh, already in the in this uh, webinar, webinar, and then of course also he, uh, hybrid systems again and the uh, heat pumps. I will. Uh, uh, speed up. This is my uh, last slide upcoming. Uh, just with a few characteristics of the heating and cooling uh, market, also showing why it's uh, uh, rather challenging to work on this market. Like other than the electricity market, you have a high heterogeneity and complexity of the market, a lot of different owners, operators, different uh, types and sizes of uh, applications, talking household level, uh, district level, uh, larger scale level. Um, as for the other sectors, but um, even more so, uh, so than for electricity, we still have a strong dependency on fossil fuel uh, fuels and uh, thereby fossil fuel prices. And uh, let's say with the current low prices, uh, as just an example, it is just cheaper to, to burn coal than biomass in Germany. So this is what people are increasingly uh, doing again, unfortunately. Um, then, of course, one of the hot topics is the interdependency of heating and cooling with the elect uh, electrical sector. Has also been mentioned, heat pumps is one of the examples, of course, combined heat and power is a classical one, but then also the future upcoming power to heat solutions. Uh, uh, so I think we will see a lot more power-based heat production in the, the heating sector. My personal feeling is here that this is a, a good solution, but we also still would still rely on the, the direct use of uh, renewable resources for uh, heat production. Okay. Um, okay, here back again, the, we, we are able, or we believe we are able to deliver 100% of the heating and cooling demand. Uh, but then this is uh, basically subject to some further developments in research and development, but also, of course, uh, uh, some policy uh, support and uh, um, yeah, how to say, uh, higher prices uh, of uh, fossil fuels, which cover societal um, costs. Um, so I will uh, conclude that uh, still a lot of developments in the heating and cooling market are necessary. However, there's a, a huge market and with that, a uh, huge potential for technological innovation. Um, on my very last slide, you have the, uh, the link to the heating and cooling platform. Please uh, visit the platform, uh, become a member of one of the, uh, uh, the working groups, uh, the panels, and uh, download and have a look at all the material. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Rainer, for uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, I also happy to to see that you gave your also personal views on the development of different technologies. And uh, uh, so, if there are no questions for for Rainer, I would really like to uh, maybe ask if uh, the the other uh, panelists have questions or comments. Uh, otherwise, uh, I would uh, really like to, to thank all of you, so all the attendees for attending and panelists for, for, for speaking. Uh, 
and uh, I would like to remind you that this uh, webinar is in the framework of the European uh, Youth Funded Project uh, SDH, so Solar District Heating uh, P2M, so Policy to Market. Please visit uh, uh, the, the website Solar District Heating for more information or write to me or to, uh, to Lore. We're going to have uh, soon another webinar organized with the network uh, uh, REN21, uh, which is the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st century. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we will give you more information with a follow-up emails and we will also let you know about uh, the slides that uh, will be available. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you very much again. Thank you for, for staying uh, with us until the very end and I wish you a very nice end of the day. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks a lot, bye-bye.